expensive, but whatever. I'm yeah. here every day. All right, so one of the hacks is if you come visit the Big Island to stop in Kona at Costco, because that's where you can get your water, sunscreen, snacks, anything that you want to load up on while you're here and actually save some money. And the nice thing about the Hawaii Costco is that a lot of times they'll have different products than what you'll find in other Costcos. Turkey jerky. Turkey is more tender. Oh, there's ahi, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah uh, so the ahi. Of course, don't forget the beer or the wine or the alcohol. Great it's gonna place be a lot to stop. Of lazy days at the pool. That's right. All right. So fresh off of our trip to Dole Plantation, we have some Dole pineapples here. And ew. if you want to know how to pick the best one, you smell the bottom. It smells pretty good. And we're here for the main reason. So, they, they, they don't have gallons, but they have this kind. So I guess we'll get this. Alright, so interestingly we have some water lobster from Canada, but we also have fresh shrimp from Kauai. It's Kauai shrimp. Giant shrimp. Yeah. Just. Yeah. This was about 200 something dollars. If we were to go out twice for four people, it's about that much. So since we're here in a house, we're paying extra for the house, but it has a kitchen. It allows us to save money from eating out and that actually amounts to more in the long run, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it especially matters because we're here for a full week. If you're only here for a couple of days, maybe that's okay to eat out, but for a full week, it's a lot of meals out. All right, we rented a 2019 Jeep Wrangler. And this is the vehicle for here. Mm How does it feel driving the Jeep? It's like a truck. It's not like a sedan or a hatchback. It's sluggish to accelerate and to stop, but so you have to premeditate a lot more. But other than that, it's fantastic. It's just really, really good. We are in our Kona residence for the week, and here's a tour. Wait, 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 so how did you book this place? From Airbnb, as usual. It's a full-on resort though, it's gated, it has multiple pools, it's on the cliff over the sea. It is kind of considered condos, I think some people might actually be residents here, but they do, they have like a front desk and everything, so it's legit, like you check in, and they know that you're with Airbnb, so there's nothing sneaky about it. Like it is an actual like resort where you can't stay yeah. as a guest. Sometimes you can score like that. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing lodging. So let's check it out. It's actually quite vertical. And this story though is only here. Pretty climb to work on your beach body. So it's quite vertical, but this is the main floor here. And first thing is you enter the living room and kitchen area. Get a washer dryer. Yeah. To your left. Which is good. Main room, quite well furnished with a very nice couch on down there. Quite comfy and once you sit here you get some views of the top of the mountain actually. I like the the fine touch that the furniture is color coordinated. Even the rail for the curtains. Here is a supreme feature and that is a full-on outside kitchen with its own sink and fridge and everything. Oh it's actually and raining right now but it's a nice rain. Yeah so here you can get a feeling of where we are. Uh, we're on this grounds that is totally manicured, tropical style, um, lush Hawaiian, it's raining, that's why it's so lush. But uh, from here, on our side, we're seeing views all the way to the top. This looks I like a golf course actually right next to us. Yeah, that is so. This is the Kona Country Club next to us. Hmm. Uh, on the other side of this property is the Sheraton down here. And um, the sea is on the other side, so we have those three neighbors here. So let's continue the tour, but I already want to come back out here. Main room, up there, tall ceiling, it's kind of a lodge style, tropical lodge style. And here we have the kitchen. And we also have my parents enjoying themselves. <laughs> <laughs> we have the first bathroom here, which has all tile, bathtub, separation of 
the toilet, which is how it's done. Two sinks, Very which nice. is also a fine touch. No wasting time in the morning for four people. <laughs> One of the bedrooms, I think they consider this master because it has a bigger deck. However, is it the master? I, I'm confused because the remote says so for the AC. But oh. that one on top seems nicer to me. It has but a anyway. bigger deck. Oh, it has its own deck. That's really nice. Yeah, so that has Very a really nice. nice deck there. That's yeah. probably why they call it master. But the bed seems a little smaller. Um, and from here, a view of fantastic mm -hmm. Kona up the hill. Yep. Where it gets interesting is that there's yet another level. Here is a little corner with all kinds of games and art and more climbing. And here is what I would say is the master, but not the remote. <laughs> and where we are lodged, another tall ceiling and another deck. This time it's smaller, no full on lying down here. But you it get has the a better really nice view. view. Yeah, you the get the great. better view here. There we go. We'll come out quick. One of the things about being in the tropics, especially in any area of mosquitoes, you want to come in and out really quickly so mosquitoes mm, don't get back. Right here into your right there yeah see gotta watch out if you look out here what you see is what you get in Kona pretty much but we're kind of beyond the main town mm -hmm. and we're south and we're near the country club and this lush rainforest shaping up here on top of the volcano pretty much mm -hmm. and over there's the gate where we're lodging so from there on this is totally gated and private here's a fine touch because that's actually what your walls look like in Hawaii not quite this big and this bright, but there are geckos already in this house, <laughs> so you depict them right there. Um, I really like the fact that this is again a tall ceiling, even more light coming in from there. So you get a very open feeling here. And another bathroom, of course, with this level as well, a little bit smaller. So I can see how they consider the other one master, but I actually like this one on top more. So I have my beer here, the Gold Cliff IPA. Just grabbed it randomly and what we're about to do is walk the grounds even though it's raining a bit it's actually gonna be nice because it will cool us so we're going to wing it because it's raining a little bit so I don't want to get the map wet and this is the main pool let's see what that's like I just saw people coming out of the pool even though it's raining which makes it just fine it's right now 80 something degrees this is a hot tub not needed at all the pool of course but this is one of three pools so we're gonna try to find the rest xt3 is back in the house i added my grip i really like it actually it extends it a bit and gives me more to hang on to and i'm enjoying my gold cliff ipa kona brewing not bad not bad it says with real pineapple. Oh, oh. IPA. Yeah. And you like an IPA? Well, it's not as terrible as the northwestern ones. Oh, it's almost not raining at all. We can cruise. I'm trying to find the other pools. Do they have pickleball though? I don't know. Sadly, us computer people and photographers have the tennis shoulder even without playing tennis, which makes us unable to play tennis. I can see the ocean through the openings what i'm looking for is the ocean side pool ah beautiful tree this is just so beautiful it's such a beautiful tree you look ready for iron man heck yeah i'm a poser to your credit you did run the honolulu marathon i did one third of an iron man <laughs> shoreline public access ocean conditions hazardous i read there is no beach in this hotel but they do say ocean access that's interesting I am not much of a swimmer, but so I do require a good beach normally to go in. But uh, I'm pretty satisfied swimming in the ocean set pool. This really is the main feature of this outdoors part of our lodging. Fantastic. What do you think? It's a bit of that place we stayed in uh, not Positano. Sedona. Amalfi. Amalfi. Remember, we're like right there. There's a yeah. the pool, like right next to the ocean. Really different, but similar too in some ways. Yeah, this is the Sunset Coast, by the way. So the sunset is happening there soon. We have coast access, and here we go. Lava rock everywhere, but it is indeed the ocean, and it doesn't get much better than this pristine Hawaiian Big Island Ocean. All right, so we lost the good sound, but it's better than losing the GoPro. But yeah, this is super cool right here. Natural arch, arc. 
in the lava rock. Uh, we're walking a path on lava rock right off the sea and our hotel is right here on the left. It's a good thing I didn't wear my slippers with my toes exposed. That is true. Because yeah, like it takes like one slip and then your feet get cut open and you can't swim anymore. One more time, the perfect shoe is the king because it's waterproof and its toe is sealed. So I am totally good right now. You see the break in the sunset. It's gonna be a good one. The path terminates, but there's quite the... Oh, it does continue in there, but we have an outing here and we can just venture out and enjoy the sunset. On the other side, we have more resorts and the Sheraton. So it's a really good view. Oop, a lava rock bird. Simply stunning, stunning setting. Whoa, and a rainbow right there. Oh my God, right there. I don't know if the GoPro can get it, but it's there. Don't void the warranty with the water sensor. Just kidding. That's cell phones. Wow, right now it's stunning light. This is a spectacular moment. Rainbow over there. Tropical forest, coconut trees everywhere, lava rock, and the ocean. This is just unreal. I, we really, really love Kona. Last time we came, we did a grand tour of the big island. We did a full circle. We spent a few days everywhere. In Kona, we spent two days and we thought it was the best part of it. In fact, we thought it was the best part of Hawaii. So this time, with no remorse whatsoever, I booked full seven days in Kona. As you should. As I should. So we'll use it as a base to go other places, but we'll spend the majority of the time here. It's the Sunset Coast, it's the dry coast, even though it's raining now. <laughs> but uh, you have the better weather and honestly the better vibe. I just love the vibe here. And you know, speaking of the rain and everything, because we've figured out our clothes and our shoes we can, and, and the GoPro, we can be out here in the rain, no problem. Yeah. But being prepared like that lets you get shots that other people can't because there's no one else out here right yeah. now. Maybe because of this rain coming down. I'm seeing a path here. The only thing is do not make missteps if you're doing this because this is lava rock, it cuts. If you fall, it cuts badly. And I have um, not fallen, but I ran into a rock because uh, it was hidden and a wave revealed it. And then I turned to run from the wave and the sand got pulled back and I split my toe open within a second. So watch your step. But here we go. This is straight up lava. Like right here, you can see how the rock was liquid and it flowed down into the ocean. This is what happened, I don't know how long ago, but this is what happened here. What you're seeing is among the freshest rock on the planet, which flowed right into the ocean. Here you have little pools forming from the waves. This is simply amazing. There have seldom been more beautiful moments in my life, honestly. And I honestly have seen a lot of beauty. I've traveled most of the world. Well, not most, but a lot of it. Wow, that weather changed so fast here. I don't know if you noticed, but it was really pretty. Like you had the golden hour and now it's like almost completely gone. The rainbow is gone. The color is really gone and it's now just pouring rain. Well, we had to come back because there's something super weird here. What is that? It might be a seed or a fruit, which is what I hope it is, but it kind of looks like balut. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like eggs. Yeah. yeah it, <laughs> it looks like the fermented it egg. It looks like an egg. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> It's been out here long enough. I don't know what the hell that was. Let's exit. We're really close to the sea and it's high tide. Yeah, so we are at Kealakekua Bay. It's kind of a beach, but you probably don't want to swim here, but a lot of people are bringing their kayaks. When it's low it's tide, really they rocky. do, but right now it's high tide, it's very high. Yeah. Um, but the biggest reason I came here is because this is the place where Captain Cook was eaten. <laughs> and if you look out in the distance, there's a white monument way out there on the other side of this bay. And that is where the whole thing went down. So this bay is famous if you have read the stories of Captain Cook. Um, he came here and this is where he interacted with the uh, royals and the chiefs and so on. And this is where his misfortune <laughs> happened. And the story goes that when he first arrived, he matched the description of a prophecy that they had. And so they treated him like a god. And there was some advantages to that. And then he got on his boats and he took off 
and that was all good but because of some circumstance i think it was due to his expedition um, he had to come back here and that did not match the prophecy and they thought it was a fraud or that he's a devil not a god and a false god and they killed him and ate him so that is how that story went down and it went down right here on this bay this is what the bay looks up close it's completely filled with these lava rocks and it's very hard to walk but some people are coming here and using it as a beach and going and snorkeling there's a coral reef inside there which seems quite rich so people are coming for that we still see, see them snorkeling there and to me it's just kind of crazy having read books and watched movies about captain cook i consider him one of the greatest explorers and the biggest reason i love to travel and i moved away from my homeland is that i am a big fan of the age of exploration uh, heroes and he's one of the biggest so it's actually almost unreal that i'm standing right here where it ended for him i've read that story many times and now i actually can see exactly where it happened that's quite incredible Dolphins here. Yeah. trail going around here we have to move very fast to avoid mosquitoes and these dogs just went down there but it's a flooded lagoon and it's probably completely infested which is not fun does not smell very good either but park closed keep out dogs are going back now here we go Due to hazardous conditions, historical park is closed and it looks like abandoned and what we see here is basically a swamp. So yeah, probably there are millions of mosquitoes around me and I'm out. Alright, so we are at Pu'uhonua Ho'onau now. <laughs> I may have mispronounced that. My Hawaiian is really rusty. But this is known as a place of refuge. So back in the day, if you broke the kapu or their sacred law, you could come here and if you reach the boundaries of this area, this was a place of refuge. And all I know about it is that it's very beautiful and you get to see some artifacts from the Polynesians. So let's have some fun. I noticed there's some expansive views. So I got my Tsais lens on, which is a 12 on a crop. Well, you know, the interesting thing too about having a place of refuge is that do we even have such a place anymore? Um, parks, a, I guess? Well, but if you, if the police are after you, you broke a law, you're a criminal. Oh, that kind of refuge. Yeah. Well, if you're a criminal. That's what this was for. Where that you, is odd. Um, yeah, yeah it is. we don't have such a place. I mean, well, kind of California. <laughs> Maybe we have sanctuary cities now. Well, that's different. <laughs> those are, those are, that's not for criminals exactly. But yeah, I guess, you know, back in the ancient Hawaiian civilization, they actually had a place of refuge. And you may have had to stay here for a long time, may have had to, you know, live here. But that's, you know, better than the opposite. And I don't think today in modern society we really have any place like that unless you just, you know, make your own up. <laughs> yeah, I, I did read about a place in California which is lawless and people are driving in there to hide out. And it actually, they say it is the last lawless part of the USA. Mm -hmm. Right here we have the big thatch building which has a canoe 
and this is how they used to go out and fish. They did not leave the archipelago, they sometimes left the islands and they always went out fishing. Ooh, oh yeah. Keep in mind these bones we're finding are right down the road from where Captain Cook was eaten. Oh come on, that's not a human job. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you had to be running away from the law, this is a pretty nice place to hang out and find refuge. And today you can come and visit it. It's considered a national park, but it is a place where you can only walk around and check out the sites. You're not allowed to kayak, snorkel, fly your drone, or even sunbathe here. It's really just for a short visit to pay respect to the area. And here we have some traditional art known as tikis. I always found those pretty cool. Do you know what they're supposed to portray? No, I don't. I guess we need to read up on, on tikis because we are unprepared, we don't know what they mean. They remind me a little bit about, of totem poles. Definitely dramatic expressions. And here it's interesting, it's built on a bed of lava rock. And right there is a bit of a congregation of them. Pretty well crafted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. Two little ones here, eight, here, nine, ten. More on the fence. This is the most I've ever seen. walking through the lava field because I have a piece of art in mind I want to make and I really like coconut trees and this little grove here is one of the nicest I've ever seen so I'm walking through this lava field to get a particular shot and I want to make a print of that and put it in our house so let's see how this goes I have a pretty decent shot from here where my foreground is lava rock and my background is the palms, so that's one option. And I also possibly have the other shot, which is just the palms, but um, I want to experiment with both. Well, I think I got my shot. It got even better because I found a tight pool in front of the palms right here, and I used my wide angle size. And I have the foreground shiny water over lava rock, and the background is these gorgeous palms. Um, so that's one of the shots I wanted and another shot I want is purely the palms So I don't know if I'll make a little mini series of two or three shots or whether I'll print out one and put it in our house Vegan protein shake. Isn't bad. 
I'm guessing these are not e-bikes. <laughs> Might yeah, be cheating. <laughs> I bet they're like super light. Yeah, ultra light. You start wondering how much you know technology helps you go faster because before all of this, these bikes were so heavy and that plays a factor in your speed and same with the shoes and everything. Let's do a test. I think I can lift you with one finger. should just dries up really quickly. job even though we're not getting paid. She's acting like she is and she's getting the shots. XT3 50 to 140 and some kick-ass slow motion with this camera and lens. We're waiting for people with flags. So they have flags that's really visual, it's really cool. And they have the finishing one, you always get the most energy and emotion because people are at the very end. Yeah. Athletes here are really excited. They're not very haggard, like they're crossing really strong. It's true, the ones finishing right now are athletic, very athletic people.
how beautiful the finish line is here, right over the beach in downtown Kona, Hawaii. This is where all of them are finishing. Yeah. Amazing, huge street right here. We're trying to switch up our angle here because we got a lot on the other angle. And even though we're on vacation and just can't, this happened to happen, so we just can't uh, avoid the opportunity to shoot. Yeah, this is fun. Yeah, let's cross over. Look how you cross. You gotta wait for a break in the runners and then you cross and right on this side here is the little beach where children are playing and now we're on the other side with a beautiful setting as well. Korean yet? Ah, yes, the Korean. Yeah, hey, we got the Korean. No Bulgarians yet, though. They're busy eating tomatoes. I'm waiting for the lone Bulgarian who probably if qualified couldn't gather the funds. This is how it's done with a massive rig right there. It makes you feel happy for them. Yeah. When they finish. Yeah. And they feel proud. So it makes you feel good for them. feel of shooting we are hit to cut Suzy off because she will fill up all the cards again if I don't and now it's a gorgeous sunset nothing like a Hawaiian sunset this is the craziest drive I've ever done We are at the overlook of Waipio Valley, one of the most beautiful places in Hawaii, Big Island. We came here last time and we actually did a horseback riding tour at the bottom and there are wild horses down there, which is really cool to see. Uh, getting down there is a little tricky because it is a really narrow, really steep road. Yeah, and when we did the horseback riding tour we had a ride and this time I'm yeah. driving it so it's yes. a little bit crazy. So. We're about to experience one side of it we did not last time. <laughs> there are many series of valleys going that way and that's a national park. This is just the first one that is accessible. If you're hardcore you can hike it and there are trails going up this huge ridge and you can keep descending into valleys that at that point are completely exclusive. Just make sure you watch for tsunamis because these valleys flood if anything hits and in fact it has wiped out this valley before in a flood. So right now we're at the Waipio Valley Overlook but there's actually a trail down here called the Mulawai Trail and it's a really long trail it actually starts at the beginning or at, at the bottom of the valley but it begins with a 1200 foot ascent in less than a mile with lots of switchbacks and it goes through 12 smaller gulches on a five mile course so in total it's about 15 miles round trip or if you start your hike from up here then it's a 19 mile round trip so a really long challenging hike if that's the kind of thing you're looking to do here and as you can see there are also a lot of emergency helipads in case you have an accident so that just shows you how limited it is to get help if you ever get hurt or stranded down there so you want to be really careful about that so this is part of the road that you can either uh, hire a van through a tour to bring you down here or if you have a four-wheel drive vehicle you can drive it down or you can hike down
track to them, I hope I don't have to. Whoever's going down yields. speed up down the hill and burn out the tire I mean the brake even though I believe these things brakes are really good and it's brand new so it doesn't matter very much mission accomplished so far it still has to be the other way too to call it a total success but we're here here we go our awesome jib on the edge I remember last time we were here I actually have a shot of a gray Jeep and it was parked somewhere around here and I remember looking at that and being like we're coming back and we're getting a Jeep <laughs> we're bringing it right here so we can do exactly this and we did it we stick to our commitments even though if they're only in our head that's right you have to have a goal so this is the kind of terrain that we're driving on down here a lot of big rocks and sand but yeah i mean this is the vehicle for it and this is one of the reasons why you get a four-wheel drive when you're on the big island in particular and interestingly enough like this trip we actually were not able to use our four-wheel drive in a lot of cases because you know people usually use it to go up to mount Kea. we couldn't do that and then uh, volcano national park a lot of those attractions also were closed Oh, and the Green Sand Beach was closed too. So this is really one of the only places where we've really been able to use this Jeep to its full capabilities. This is one of the reasons why we really made a push to make this a destination so that we could actually use our four-wheel drive. Yeah, that's, that's the shot. Is actually another road where you can keep going further down the valley past a lot of private property so you do have to be mindful of that and it looks like you know there is a big waterfall and there was a trail but there's a pretty old sign here that says it's closed don't come to do that trail but uh, there the road keeps going we're going to do it all right yeah you should film it so we weren't gonna do it but it looks like we are gonna do it i don't know what the name of this tree is but we had a tree similar to this back at home and my brother and i used to actually make little boats out of it i did this because i didn't think we we're gonna cross the river so i wanted some kind of piece of action but it looks like we're gonna cross it so
uphill now and we have the right of passage so if someone comes against us they should be backing out that's according to the sign and so and I'm sticking to it so I'm not backing down kind of a shame with this hyper smooth you don't get a sense of how <laughs> turn it off actually yeah, turn it no. off no <laughs> into a paved parking lot near a park much more civilized than we just were but that was among the coolest driving experience I've ever had that was fun it was bumpy so you have to be okay with that it is bumpy it's a little scary at times but totally worth it uh, a lot of other Jeeps doing it too so it's not you know the worst experience it's not gladiator coming down <laughs> which is pretty awesome but yeah great experience and you know you can always do it by tour or you can do it on foot but this is for sure a really really probably the funnest way to do it yeah i think it's the most fun and i never felt uncertain at all mm -hmm. it was great this jeep is so good <laughs> So we pulled over on the side of the road to where you would normally take a turn to go up to Mount Ikea, but there is a protest going on. Yeah. So. <laughs> We're completely blocked from reaching the summit where all the telescopes are and the crater. And instead we have a major protest which has been going on for months. So yeah, this protest has been going on since April. The mount is not accessible. Mm -hmm. We'll see what these people are fighting for. If they're willing to talk to us, yep. let's find out. We'll see if we can get. All around us is spectacular scenery. It's really pretty. The clouds are actually coming in. It is chilly. Yeah. It's a good thing we have our Seattle clothing. Yeah, we brought our clothing just for this. And we're dressed like for the mountain, which is where we are. The other thing is, since we're from Seattle, we are very familiar with protests. So <laughs> I photographed a fair share of Protect. We hope lives clean, life lives clean, water for plants, animals, fish. This protest is fittingly on top of a lava field. Yeah, really the scenery is pretty nice. We just missed going up the summit or down, down I think. Wow. We need to use our Fujis a bit too. Yeah, we'll capture the scenery here. We're approaching the main area and it's golden hour. We have a little bit of light. It's pretty perfect timing. Yeah. It's I drove idea, really actually. fast to get here yeah. in a good light. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and in some weird way, I'm actually glad that this is going on right now because, you know, ideally we'll have another chance to come back and do Mount Kea, but how many times are we going to be able to see a protest here? That's right. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's and very we see. Newsworthy. We're seeing some kind of prayer or something happening there. Yeah, we'll go see what's going on. Hopefully they will predispose, but all we want to do is spotlight their cause, so mm -hmm. I don't think they'll be opposed to that. Well, here we see some of the tents where people have been lodging for a long time. And we are seeing some kind of dance going on. Hawaiian flags flying. This is the sign says couple, which I think means forbidden. Mm -hmm. This is literally happening under the summit of Mauna Kea. Oh, you, oh, 
na kia ko uho o hihi ke ia hula. You like this one? Beloved lineal descendants of this land, we take our place here not because we think it's all right from a real ego kind of standpoint. No, no, no. We take our place here because our mama needs us, because she sustains us, not just with her resources, but because her. And this Mauna over here, they protect this island from major, I couldn't say the word out loud, you know, the kind of things. We cannot do that. Only entities as large as these can do that. And as the whole Aina, we say, we're not going to let another building go on top. We are the Hoa Velolike, the Pacific Island cousins. They came. All we had to do was only to them. They came. And they keep coming. They come in the way of food for the kupuna tent. They come in the way of this mat that we're sitting on, doing the aha. They come in the way of people sharing their language and their chants and bringing their most beloved treasures. They part with their most beloved treasures because in their eyes, we are them. We are the Hoapili. Where are our Hoapili? They're all over. I see them walking all over. We see them in the news standing for their water rights. 
we see them in the nose protecting Wara from unnecessary construction. We see them in the news trying to restore a forest that has been ravaged. Those are our Hoopili. And yet, they have time to come and stand with us. And we stand with you. Aloha ina ho aloha. Because nobody else would stand this kind, this, this kind of self-discipline that we have to, we have to live in this self-discipline. Kapu Aloha is not a brand new thing. The Makakoa and the Makakaeo know what this is. We are they. Because there is nobody else to stand here. We it. We are the Kukia Imauna. We are the Pohakuku, the standing rocks. We are the foundational rocks all over this place, the very rocks that make up this island. That's why we cannot just give up, go home. These rocks are us. The elements in these very rocks are in your bones. We're not just we're not just uh, uh, protecting the vai for our consumption. We're protecting the vai for this kumoku hali'i. You see all the greenery that covers the landscape that pops up by itself out of the lava. Those people. We protect the water because even our fish that live in the ocean, in next to the papa, in the coral reefs, they need fresh water too. Thank Thankfully, Big Mama has stores of vai in liquid form, in solid form, all the way from the top. Kodi even talk about this place today. We learned a lot of stuff. Besides what we already know, ah, blow my mind. Water all inside here. That's why we know Kinhana Ino. Because we know the water is down there. That's who we are. And we rise like a mighty wave every time we come and recommit to this process. It might not be the most perfect aha, uh -huh, but it's perfect every single time you put your best, best energy inside. That's what makes it perfect. It's not perfect because of the people who sit on that mat. The aha is not perfect just because of the mele itself. Or because our footwork is all super duper. You should see the footwork I can see from over there. <laughs> no. Our aha is perfect because with whatever we had at the moment, we brought together and we taught out because we knew that five people cannot possibly hold ritual for this big mountain and all of the elements that she, that is in her sphere of influence for an undeterminable number of days. It's going to take a pie aina. And by you coming and putting, doing your best, that's what makes the aha perfect. Ooh, and if that's the only thing we have in common, that's enough. We just witnessed the protest dance of the protesters here. It was entirely in Hawaiian language and it consisted of what I think, hula. Yep. 
It was uh, multiple hula dances. Uh, what's interesting is you have a lot of locals taking part and Native Hawaiians, but there's also like there was a lady from, I'm not sure where she was from, but she, I don't think she was from this area, but she said that she came in a week ago and she's here in solidarity. So you have people flying in from all over the world. Uh, this whole protest has gotten a lot of international attention. It's been going on since April. And as they reminded us, you know, part of why they're out there, actually the whole reason why they're out there is to show discipline and integrity. And it sounds like they're just the front line of defense. So they are there 24-7. I think they're dancing not only to, um, as part of the movement, but also just to literally keep themselves moving because it is cold and the sun just went down. Yeah, it's only getting colder from now. Mm -hmm. And so the protest is really obstructing the road to prevent the construction of a very large large telescope here, mm -hmm. which is what, the 17th they would be here, or 14th, something well, like that? Well, 13th, I think. Yeah. So there's already, I think, 12 or 13 uh, telescopes here. This one that they'd be building would be, I think, huge. I think it's like 17 stories. Yeah. It would be huge, uh, over a billion dollars. But yeah, they are standing here to protest the construction of that telescope. And we'll see how long they'll be able to hold out and what the outcome will be. Uh, you can hear the speech for yourself. We're not going to present any opinion or side on this. This is simply what we saw. Mm -hmm. This is just coverage for us. And, you know, it's unfortunate we're not able to visit, but at the same time, I do think it's important to be here to document this while it's going on because it is a very historic uh, protest that's going on, and we'll have to keep an eye out and see what happens, what the right. result is. It is still unfolding. There is a hole, huh? Well, I'll try it for a little bit. For the tube, we are at Kaumana Caves near Hilo, and we just got greeted by a chicken. The cave begins right off the road, actually, and it's very steep. Looks very tropical. It does. Ooh, gotta watch it, though. It's much cooler down there. Though. Ah, that's the goal. Yeah. Slick steep staircase, as it is to be expected in these conditions. Wow, look at that. Very much cooler, I love it. All right, I've entered the fridge. It's getting cooler by the second. This is the bigger part of the cave here. And I actually have a flashlight, which is in the car. How silly is that? So this is the legit cave entrance here. I always love the entries of tropical caves. Very green. Because it's cooler and wetter than most parts. We came semi-prepared because I do have a flashlight and we do have a loom cube. So let's see what we get down here. We're going to test the limits of this loom cube and go down to this cave. Some other people that came out said it actually goes down pretty far. So we'll see how far we dare to go in this cave. All right. And the loom cube has grades of power. Mm -hmm. So we're about to test them in pitch darkness. And I have a light on my head. Caves, of course, are super slick and dangerous. Lava flowed through this cave in particular. So it's yeah. a it's a lava tube, really. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I see how it bleeds. A yeah. ton of light. Well, it's also at the max power right now. So That's okay. Down. I just distance it a little bit. But yeah, I don't know if because our lens are cracked on the GoPro or what, but it's bleeding a ton of light. And the loom cube is powerful and, oh well, wow. The lava is shining from my point of view here, right there, it's crazy. Well, the ground is jagged, you gotta watch it. This is more like a paved path, but it's lava. Interesting, going through a lava tube with the GoPro and a loom cube. Yeah, this is a little different, so I don't know if you've been in any caves up in the northwest. 
but those caves have more of like the stalagmites or stalactites like they're like crystals that kind of hang from like the ceilings but this is totally different because... yeah this is straight up lava flowing yeah. through here in a tube exactly. form at this point it kind of ends really because i can make it and i will but it's blocked and then it gets really short another well this lava looks like plastic it's so shiny and smooth right here it terminates so oh, actually there is a hole <laughs> well people did well i did do a lot of duck walking in elementary i'll try it for a little bit for the tube okay duck walking on lava that is next level with the big camera back pulling me backward so that i oh, slick too i see oh boy oh it opens up here again this is what i just went through it's like half my height i had to crouch and walk duck walk pretty much yeah and then it opens up again so now i'm standing again and it's high above me so that was the kind of a little choke point there i'm not sure if susie's gonna do this are you shooting over there okay i'll be back in a minute uh, 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 i'm getting short again It does go for a long time. It's not as small as you think when you enter. Well, wow, it opens up right here, big time. It's so big, in fact, now that my light can't illuminate it. I'm back to the first choke point here, where I now need to make my way out. It requires some crawling around lava rock. Almost out of the hard parts. And here we are back at the exit. Feels like cakewalk now that I can stand and it's pretty even. And here we go back out. I'm completely wet. It's very humid and drips and duck walking and stuff. It is fun. Ah. Well, once again, we were very suited to our strengths and weaknesses because that was not something I would do. I mean, that was a really cool cave, very different. We went to that one cave in Belize. The mouth of it felt kind of similar, but yeah. obviously the rocks are completely different here. Yeah, and the other cave in Belize had a beach that was nuts. That is true. Yeah. Yes. This is different. Lava tube and keeps getting narrow, but sometimes it opens up again, so you don't know when it ends. Mm -hmm. I thought this was a straight up end, but no, it goes through there and into mm -hmm. somebody's property in the jungle. <laughs> you see this? There's a bathroom and there's even a water fountain. That cave is actually a state park. So it's somewhere that, you know, they have warning signs or a danger, keep out, you're entering at your own risk. And obviously you have to come prepared, but it is considered a state park and you are free to visit and explore. Yeah, and America does state parks well. And look, they drill the pipe right through the lava rock and the jungle so they can have a water fountain right on top of the cave. Like, how civilized is the USA? Or a picnic bench. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and you can have a picnic right there. And then lava rock bench as well. What's also funny is that in Washington you have the Northern State Hospital. It's also a state park. So you can go <laughs> explore an abandoned mental hospital. Yeah, America does parks better than anybody else. We are at the Rainbow Falls, a gorgeous area. I think we stopped by last time. It's an 80 foot waterfall and really gorgeous. And it's very accessible, so really easy to get to. It doesn't require a long hike. I believe the path is even paved. And I can throw the falls just over there. So let's go check it out. Once again, railing and everything because um, in America they make a special effort to enable people. 
They, they don't want only the most able to get here. And if you are very able, there are places for you to go exclusively. But they've managed to develop things so that people of all kinds of ability can do it and enjoy themselves and share the, the nature, you know. So here's the ascent. In fact, if you look at this too, you can see that there's one railing that's kind of old. <laughs> yeah. And instead of fixing that, they just put in another railing, which is kind of funny. But yeah. hey, that means that they're, you know, taking care of it. Here it is. On this side, they actually did build a wheelchair ramp. No drones. So yes, wheelchairs. Ooh, and this is actually the view. Wow. In the jungle, on a volcanic island in the middle of the Pacific. This is what we do it for. All the driving and the flying and the getting up early and suffering through the heat and getting eaten by mosquitoes and all the rest of it. This reminds me of Palouse Falls where we just went and say, yeah. there were signs everywhere of how many people have died this year. The people still are walking right over the water. Yeah, so watch it. Hey. Great video though. Uh-oh. Might go viral, but a bit morbid. Here, you're barred. But there is a very cool view right here with the frame yeah for this I'm gonna have to take out my Fujifilm and do this correctly all right so first thing here is I have a frame which is dark and a um, subject in the middle which is bright so I, I have to go to 400 dynamic range also I'm shooting Velvia because I want the greens to pop right now it's cloudy and the last thing is um, I have the H XH1 so after I was done with video now I'm switching to still and thanks to the xh1 i have the ability to slow down my shutter a lot so what i can do is go to very low shutter speed and make the waterfall look smooth while it's still handheld but i need for that a filter which i do happen to have this is why I travel with variable ND filters and normally I use this for video but right now it actually is required for this photo let's see what we get now I can get a one second shutter even and this also lets me go to ISO 800 and yet dim the shutter a lot so that I can get the max dynamic range the correct exposure I can probably go lower. The, the issue with going lower is I miss the sweet spot of my lens. So I'm trying to stay at f11 and keep dimming, but I'm already maximum dim at 800. So this is pretty much what I'll get. Let's see here. So XH1 with IBIS. And here we go. Silky smooth waterfall handheld the only thing he didn't do which you should do for landscape photography is shoot in raw i am shooting raw. oh you are shooting in yeah. raw good okay because normally he doesn't but Actually, you know what yes, yeah yes. you especially when you're in nature like this when you have that dynamic range you got to shoot in raw just because you can re recover those highlights a lot better and edit your image in photoshop And you know, another thing with the variable NDs is that they are definitely intended for video. I have tried to do still photography with it. I think it's hit or miss because a lot of times you can't always lock that ND into place, which we're not being sponsored or anything, but I think that that is a benefit of the Polar Pro filters by Peter McKinnon is that you can actually lock those NDs into place. And so I haven't got one yet, but I am actually thinking about it because that is a big strength about an ND filter like that because otherwise you can't really tell like what ND it's at. You have to just kind of eyeball it. And sometimes you can have that effect that you get polarizers where that ND isn't quite tilted the way you want it to be. So you can get some really weird vignetting and colors. And so uh, if you're doing photography, you really should invest in a proper ND, which is not a variable ND, <laughs> but then that just means carrying a lot of extra stuff with you. But when you're in a pinch, a variable ND like this will also work. Nice. Yeah, and the yeah. other thing too is that, yeah, if you have a camera yeah, without IBIS, you can try to handhold it, but you really, again, should have a tripod. That's what people normally have to do. 
But yeah, with this, with the IBIS on the X-H1, we are pushing our limits and we'll have to take a look at it on the computer, but right now it looks really good. You know what I am doing as well as all the things that I mentioned? First thing is I'm holding my breath. As I'm shooting, I hold my breath completely during the exposure. Mm -hmm. And second is I have this turnstile bag by Think mm -hmm. Tank, right? So it's resting on my shoulders and I'm resting my elbows on it and then I'm cupping the lens. So there's no motion whatsoever in me as I'm holding for about a second. Yeah, that's a good thing about like you need like to support your arms when you shoot handheld like this. Another thing that people do is you can also use your neck strap and you can actually get some tension with that neck strap and hold it out a bit. But obviously that can start to hurt your neck after a while. But right now, yeah, that looks pretty solid. Just propping yeah, your elbows up. With the framing. Nice. I have dynamic range that yep. covers both the sky and mm -hmm. the trees and the green. Yeah. And this is full zoom right here. Full zoom on a handheld shot. All right, now let's say you don't have a variable ND filter or an ND filter at all. You can still attempt to get a shot sort of like that if you just max your... So you want your ISO to be as low as possible. In this case, it's ISO 160. And then you're just going to bump your f-stop to be as big as it possibly can get. So right now I'm at like f22. And that gets my shutter speed down to two and a half. And so again, no IBIS, so this probably is not going to work out as well as the X-H1. But let's compare the shots and let's just see looks like. Yeah, one caveat is that way you're limited to dynamic range 100 because you're at such a low ISO. Eventually I hope cameras will come out they can do dynamic range 400 at ISO 160 or 100. That would be really enabling. So again, not quite as smooth as yours, but you can get some smoothing effect. So you can get a similar effect, but obviously, yeah, you should carry your ND filters to get the best possible effect of waterfalls. Whenever you do things like that, as we're doing now, some camera professor is going to come, oh my god, this is horrible, you have to have a tripod, you have to spend six hours here, you have to be a pack mule. No, you don't, because we're hitting something like 12 subjects today. We are not the type that stays and takes their time to take the perfect shot. We actually go for a day of adventure and shooting as we go, that's our style. Yeah, I mean, if you are a professional, then yes, you have to take into consideration time of day. You want to be here at golden hour or first thing in the morning. You want to have all the proper gear, but even if you don't, you can pull off some really amazing shots. Yeah, nowadays the technology is so good, and if you have a little bit of skill, mm -hmm. even with a portable setup like ours, you can get great shots, mm -hmm. and many. Let's see what my phone can do. <laughs> Your phone will do well. I love the frame right there, right there. You can also cheat with the phone. Yes. All right, let's go. And here we are in front of one of the grandest trees we've ever seen. Yeah, so you have like the main tree here and then there's like... I don't know if this is all part of the same tree and then it just kind of sprouts out here because the roots just keep going. And yeah, it's a ridiculous tree. It looks like there's no people here, so let's try to get our shots. Yeah. The crowds come back. All right, this is it. This is insane. This is uh, my mom going down there through the trees for scale. Yeah, really. So you can see what we're talking about here. The human looks like a little ant. Let's see if it's at all possible to climb this thing with the GoPro. This is pretty intense and crazy. Uh, looks like there is a way. And it's amazing. Wow. I'm inside the tree now. I can get higher for a while, but I'm not going to for too much longer. I am now quite a bit higher. Down looks like a death trap because these narrow roots and branches are so easy to, if you fall, to break something. So you gotta really watch it. Oh, here we go. I think I'll call it quits right here, but 
I am now up a huge banyan tree. This is incredible. Oh, wow. Let's see. There we go. Incredible. Incredible. Still a huge branch system going up. And I'm quite a high, like maybe halfway. I could continue climbing, but without both hands and proper shoes, I don't want to. And I don't see the point, frankly, but this is pretty, really, really incredible. Wow. I have never climbed anything like this. This is crazy. One handed, too. But the telepod is letting me grab simultaneously branches and the GoPro sometimes. Can't hold much weight that way, but it still lets me climb. Whew. Success. Oh man. Kilauea Volcano Visitor Center here and there's a crater rim drive and there's a viewing platform over here where you go by car and afterwards there are some hikes and caves on this side and later a long road all the way to the ocean which is called the chain of craters and that's what we'll be doing today. <laughs> we are at the Kilauea Volcano near the crater however the actual crater overlook is closed permanently for now it says due to hazard. So we were here several years ago and did a trail that yeah is no longer open so you just never really know the conditions but uh, here we have some steam vents and it is a little chilly I don't know what temperature it is exactly but I mean I'm wearing a fleece and I'm still kind of cold and I'm pretty so, cold <laughs> so the steam vents are actually a nice place to stand you can't stand too long because you will actually get a little too warm but right oh yeah right there I got a wisp of it <laughs> I got <Whoa>. steamed <laughs> yeah I, I like it quite nice because um, I thought it would be much hotter than it is but the winds I think are making it cold it's pretty windy when you're on the Big Island in particular, and even parts of Maui, uh, it's not always hot and tropical. You do actually want to bring long pants, jacket, just leave it in your rental car because you just never know when you're going to need it during the day. And yeah, they do have lots of signs that kind of warn you, like, don't enter, don't go here, don't go there. And it's really just a matter of safety out here. If they're telling you don't go there, you really shouldn't go there. There are multiple hiking trails out here as well. They vary. I think I saw ones from like one mile to just two or three miles, up to like four miles. There might even be longer ones. And there's also a military camp here where you can actually rent a cabin and stay overnight. But you do have to be military affiliated to do that. Is it a little camping? I'm not sure. Not sure. So yeah, if you do come here, you kind of have to plan to do like a full day trip. There are some Airbnb cabins closer to the park, but for the most part, you're gonna have to stay somewhere else and actually drive in. Let's see what we can get on foot since the main overlook is closed and cars cannot get near. as good as the visitor center except a little lower the visitor center has higher elevation but this is a giant crater <laughs> oh, this is so cool <laughs> it's like mars and it is different from uh, the one on maui because we've been to that one as well but that also gives you that feeling of being on mars you can we did that hike it was such a cool hike yeah oh, i wish we were, we were gopro vlogging back then but we weren't we'll just have to do it again someday 
But uh, Haleakala is also really cool over on Maui, and that's where people go to watch the sunrise. And afterward, most people leave, but you should really stay and do that hike down the crater because it's really beautiful and different. This it's a different landscape than what this looks like. You see right now, there's a buildup of lava, but it's all a mile under the surface, and mm -hmm. eventually it will bubble up. But right now, it's still down. So currently rare actually for the last few decades that it isn't erupting because it's been erupting for a long time yeah and it's also worth noting if you're not familiar with the hawaiian islands the big island the one that we're on right now is also the youngest it's the one that has had the most volcanic activity most recently one thing to note to note while we're here is that if you look at the chain of islands Kauai is the oldest one of the big ones and it's the smallest therefore the eruptions are only getting bigger through time yeah so this island is bigger than all the rest of them put together and yes. it's youngest therefore lava is coming out now way more than ever before these flowers make me think that unfortunately someone died here and it is indeed very dangerous you really need to observe all the guardrails when you're here I could see the temptation for people to go and shoot and things like that, but I'm listening to the guardrail. Well, it's just like, come on, like you can feel the steam. <laughs> yeah. It's obviously hot. And you know, like like the sign actually says too, it's like you just you just don't know how stable the, the, the land is below you and you could actually collapse. You could end up in the source of that steam vent. So like yeah. how awful would that be? Yeah, that is true. This is unstable land among the most yeah. unstable on earth. So listen yeah. to the signs. Not worth it, not worth it for that photo. Whatever you can. <laughs> so cool. And what's interesting because it's, it contrasts what we normally see when we go to national parks because in the Pacific Northwest our national parks are gorgeous. They're yeah. lush. They're, you don't see like anything black like this unless there was a fire recently. We do have one volcano park as well though. Mount St. Helen in the Northwest is the last eruption was actually the year I was born and it blew out the many miles like tens of miles of forest and houses even. So actually we can see, or I can see a little thing about travel photography here. It's especially an editorial request these days or like tourism boards. They really want photos not just of beautiful landscapes but they want people, either people interacting with it or just like a subject because without it it just doesn't give you scale, it doesn't feel like a tourism or travel friendly shot. So. And there are ways to do that without, you know, going up to people, having to get model releases, having them pose. So what I like to do is try to get someone that's like ahead of us or someone behind us so that, you know, if they're wearing a hat, wearing sunglasses or just interacting and you can see enough of them to know that there's a person there but not capture their identity, getting those kind of shots are really good for travel. And this is the trail back to the visitor center actually. So we came by car, but you can actually make it on foot. You can just park over there and explore. And here is really cool because there's foliage and steam coming out right under it. Well, and yeah, basically do not step because even stepping right here, you begin falling down into the steam vent. And here, many plants are not able to cope with the steam and other um, pollution that comes out of the volcano so you see how things start dying quickly here it's not very easy to survive even for plants even though you can see how so close to the crater there is life but it is also battered a bit it's not completely healthy it's also saying here and I don't know how current that is, but it's it's closed because of volcanic gases. Mm. So that's another thing. You may not be able to see any any apparent danger, but it's almost like carbon monoxide or something. Just you know, like gas that's there that you really shouldn't be inhaling. That you know, if you inhale too much of it, it can make you sick or even kill you. So it sounds like that's really what some of the issues here might be. Mm. Those gases are just getting stronger, and the wind causes it to blow, and they just don't want you to go near them. There it is. Wow. Crazy, who it smells? Yep. Here, these are constantly getting hit by noxious gases, so it does not look healthy. Yeah, and this rusts and corrodes really fast, you can see. Yeah. Looks to me like a lot of iron. Hmm. I read into it. It says the reason the soil is red in Oahu is there's too much iron in it. Yes but they said that that's why pineapples grow so well. 
behind me is Kilauea Iki. So it erupted in 1959 and when it did, it shot lava 2,000 feet into the air. Uh, right now there is a trail and a group in front of us is uh, actually going to go down and do it. But the trick is you have to start at the top, make your way down, walk around and then come all the way back up. So it sounds like it's an out and back trail. Here you can see how on the rim of the crater there's jungle growing. Doesn't nope. this make you feel like Jurassic Park? Like a velociraptor is going to come and like... <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're the velociraptor. <laughs> yeah. And my nails are a little long, I need to cut them. <laughs> but right. what makes me feel that way is these ferns. These are ferns and I wish I could stand. Actually, can you try to get me in front of them? Because right. they're like... Martin for scale. Well, they're like four times, five times my height. Yeah, Martin's what, 6'2"? Yeah. So that's a fern. These are way bigger even than those sunflowers we saw in Chilliwack. Yeah, yeah that's a <laughs> prehistoric fern if I've seen one. Right here is a drop off. A very long drop into the crater. I am right on the edge of the crater. A little bit scary, a little bit. This is a <laughs> secondary crater, by the way. The main one is beyond there the, yeah. in the back. And but this is a fairly recent eruption. Yeah. Wow. A very round crater as well and very high yes. it's very steep it's kind of looks like darth vader's head <laughs> he pulls off his mask and it's like wrecked here they left it a lot of places they blocked but that edge they left pretty jungle here i remember that from last time Walking the devastation trail. Things changed a bit. Here you can see how the volcano from the latest eruption in 1959 in this area blew out all the flora and now it's starting to come back. It's been six years or so, but it's not very much, but it's coming back. of Bali <laughs> we're here in a lava field which is totally different yeah yeah this is the end of the road literally and looks like very fresh lava it's not that fresh really it was fresher where we were the other day uh, by that village well that was brand new <laughs> yeah 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 but yeah this is you know relatively fresh I'm not sure exactly when this lava flow is from but it just goes on and on in fact there's about five miles more of it if you just keep going down we're not gonna go down all the way that way but it's just really cool to see something like this and even like looking at the terrain and being like hiking it you couldn't make it too far honestly yeah it's rough so we're gonna show you some shapes here and some life springing from the lava rock you do want to watch it because these rocks are sharp and you don't want to fall or anything or drop your camera so yeah be last thing you want is to split your knee open on this right. right here you can see different layers and metals and whatnot within the lava it's really fascinating really like the closer you get to it it's like shiny and you pick it up it's actually really light you know considering it's a rock like the wind is almost blowing it away like when I throw it up like that. Do it, throw it. Feel it. Yeah, it does yeah. sway it, yeah. It's almost like, but it's really pretty. It's got some nice color to it and a lot of pores. But the one thing about, especially in Hawaii, I don't know if this is true in other islands or other areas, but you don't want to take lava rock home with you. It uh, goes back to just like Hawaiian mythology and legends. You're cursed if you do that. So if you take it, it's at your own risk. I wouldn't do it. So leave it here. They're here, straight up bubbly, where the lava was bubbling and flowing slowly 
or here, crazy shapes. Here there are so many colors, it's kind of like a rainbow. Starts with shiny, there's some blue, some yellows, black obviously, then it goes into red and orange down there. All kinds of colors. Probably equally amazing is how with these brutal winds and just barren rock, you start getting these ferns and other plants are taking root in little cracks at first and then they protect other things around them and soil starts to form. So then the whole thing gets restored and you can see it this way, the grasses have now start taking over, but this way is too fresh. You don't have even grass, you have a few ferns and a few trees. Some really crazy cracks. You can, if you're a photographer, you can spend days in here just looking through these shapes. These amazing shapes here. And right here, you see so many layers and colors. Whew, it burns. So, I'll just do a little quick demo of what I've been doing. I want to convey how apocalyptic this is. And the, the, the truth is, there's a lot more color here than you might expect. Although with our polarizers, we're seeing more color than our cameras can actually see. Like we're seeing red. Yeah. So there's advanced filters in here where you can isolate colors. And I thought that might be a little fun. I'm just like, I wanted to show everything kind of black except isolating green colors. So all you see is that green tree there. That's cool. So kind of having some fun with that. I tried it with red and the camera doesn't pick up that oh, there's wow. any red here. It's interesting. There's it a lot of red. shows it, but the camera doesn't see it that way. You're right, my shades see it, it way more. Pure black. So, but yeah, you can have some fun. I think some, a place like this is a great time to use those creative filters and just get a little crazy. Try something different. All right, let's do a little shooting with these yep. rocks and then we run before we burn completely. Yeah, exactly. It's really hot. We're the only ones out here, in fact. <laughs> so yeah, we'll have some fun and head back. churches here so they don't seem to work today too much it's not a huge commercial place like Kona or Waikiki this is more of a place where people live even though it's quite nice it has a promenade of kind of 50s vintage style shops mm -hmm. and it's right by the beach as well yeah there's a big bay here in fact when I was in high school I used to do competitive canoe paddling and my team actually made it to the state so we actually competed right there so that was my first time that I can remember coming to Hilo yeah we came four years ago as well and uh, you never saw it sunny then, it was raining the whole time and I had one extra day and I stayed and I saw it get sunny and then the beaches on this side turned amazing. So today is sunny, sorta. So we're going to try to hit up some of the beaches on this side. Some crazy art here too, very cool art. What, what you can do here is go down this promenade and look at art and buy some if you want and get good food. Yeah, chiropractic adjustments. <laughs> Which you know, we need. At law. So yeah, there's a little bit more service for people that would live here, but there's also a lot of shops, restaurants. In fact, we're on our way to one very soon. Yes, we'll tell you our favorite spot yes. in Hilo and one of the best restaurants on the Big Island. So here it is, keeps going. It's a strip, looks 50s to me some adventuring and there's a lot of that on this island this looks like a shop here aloha grown nice shirts for sure and looks like coffee yeah it's a nice shirt aloha grown this could be a buy yeah the designs here are great tropical design hilo you need to start putting art on quick dry fabrics mm -hmm. that's when i'll start buying them Right now, we're always dressed plain because of that. All right, 
Alright, yeah. so we are here at Cafe Pesto in Hilo. It is actually my mom's, one of my one of her favorite restaurants. She told me that she often dreams about eating at Cafe Pesto. And this is our ooh, <laughs> juicy lime there. It's really juicy lemon and it's sprayed everywhere. This is our third time at Cafe Pesto. I want to say we went, yeah, even twice last time. If you come to downtown Hilo, you'll notice that this place is always packed, full of people. Um, even in the other stores, I heard people talking about it. So everybody knows about this place. And I'd say that the menu is maybe more Italian because I saw, you know, pasta, pizza on the menu, as well as, you know, some soups and salads and sandwiches, but they use a lot of local ingredients. Today we've got the fish sandwich. It's a mahi-mahi served with a bolokai sweet potato salad. And you've got... Calamari and garlic bread. Is it like a coconut crusted calamari? Yeah, that's why I got it. Yeah, it looks really great. Comes with a little slaw, fresh slaw. This dip is pretty much jam or jelly. Oh yeah? It's like jalapeno oh, okay. jelly. So it makes it kind of sweet. Yeah, it's very sweet. Good fish, really juicy. No, the sauce is great. The sauce really adds to it. Here everything has a twist. So it's like a traditional something and then twist. Mm -hmm. So mine is the coconut on the calamari batter. And yours has an interesting anchovy based sauce. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh man, but that sweet potato salad is really good. Yeah, and the salad is sweet potato. So everything has a little twist. Yeah. This kind of steals the show right here. Since we're on vacation, we couldn't resist but get some dessert here. And yeah, so we got a cheesecake and it actually has a chocolate chip, a Belgian chocolate chip uh, cookie as a crust. And I think it's lily koi or passion fruit uh, sauce on top and then crumbled coconut or toasted coconut on top. It looks amazing. It looks lavish and, and beautiful, yes. Oh man. Yeah. Next level. Mm. Oh yeah. Incredible. Super good. I like the idea of adding that cookie as a <laughs> crust, you know? I don't know if chocolate and cheesecake are necessarily the best combination, but I do like the idea. Maybe like a vanilla macnut cookie would be really nice. We are near Hilo where it always rains, however, when you do get a sunny day, it clears up spectacularly because, because of all the rain, the beaches are green. So when it's clear, it's fantastic. You get a very green environment right on the ocean. It's pretty nice because you have like a parking lot here and if you're lucky enough to get parking, if not, then there's some street parking on the side as well, but you have a big beach and also it looks like some ponds. It's almost like... I'm not sure if this is fresh water, salt water, but at the very least, I'm sure that the waves come over the, the wall right here and just fill up this pond. This water is so clear. Yeah, it's cool, huh? You know, so Big Island beaches can be a little more tricky than other ones like Maui because there's not really sand. There's some, times, but not many. Yeah, it's not a very obvious swimming beach. Like right here, it's like you can swim, but it's more of like a drop off from the rock wall. <laughs> Well, there's a staircase. Right, right, right. But it's just different. You would expect like sandy beach, yeah, but it's Maybe not. It's that way. <laughs> Let's check out what's that way. Here we see what beaches in Hilo are like. Very different story. People are in the shade under green trees. And there's a tiny black sand beach. And a coral reef, apparently. Gorgeous. Simply gorgeous. Here we have another gorgeous environment with these trees. There are all these fruits on the ground from these trees and it smells like bad wine. On this side you have what looks like another lagoon which is really pretty. I love this terrain. So gorgeous. You got the right lens for this. The GoPro is getting it just right, the composition, so that size is gonna as well.
all because the last eruption of the Kilauea volcano happened right here. It's hoping is a connection to the highway is now this. And there's some people looking at it, but this is really fresh lava. We may take a peek, but um, I cannot actually connect the way I wanted to. I stayed in this village called Pah Paho, and I don't know if it's there anymore. It's a bit scary because I think some, at least some houses got taken. So if you keep walking, there's like this paved road and it looks kind of freshly paved. And I saw a guy riding a bike and he rode all the way down. I think the drone is able to see what's down there where he's going. But as you go further down the road and you step off, you can see all of this like lava rock. It's really interesting. It's like still pretty fresh and a little fragile. So you do want to watch your step, but it's just a really interesting consistency. If you pick it up, it's like, almost can like break in your hands. And it's a little shiny. It sounds almost like coins jingling in your hands. We need a bit of surveillance. We need to see what happened here. basically just rocks that get ground up, usually coral. But in the case of the big island, you've got lava rock, so that turns into black sand. You got a lot of black sand beaches. This one is called Punalu'u Black Sand Beach. We're looking for turtles. We're hoping turtles send, there's one right there. They oh. The beach like right here. And it's oh, yes. uh, state law, you're not allowed to touch them. But you can get semi-close to them. Nice.
Hills Bakery in the United States, the Kunalu'u Bakery, and they have a wide variety of items, but they're most known for their malasadas, which are Portuguese fried donuts. And they're usually filled with uh, custard, hapia, all kinds of flavors. So we're gonna go inside and get some. So we have here the malasadas. They are available plain, but if you ever get a chance to get them filled, I highly suggest that you do, because there's all kinds of different fillings you can get. This one in particular has guava jelly. And guava jelly is a little hard to find, so definitely get guava jelly if you ever get the chance to. And then this one is topped with lily koi, or passion fruit. And it's really similar to my mom's passion fruit butter, so I definitely had to try this one. And I'm not sure if it's filled. Is it filled? It may just be topped. Yeah, so it's a plain malasada, but it has some uh, lily koi uh, butter on top of it. Mm -hmm. it's really good. Really, really good. Not quite butter, actually. It's more like a glaze. Wow, really messy. Mm. That's the chill. That's really good. Mm. Really, really good. That's the best one. We are here at the southernmost point of the United States. That's right, and it's very beautiful and very windy. Uh, honestly, there's not a whole lot to do here. You just pull up, there's some people fishing, but there's no commerce or anything. You just come here, take some photos. Uh, you could jump off the cliff. It's not super high, but there are warning signs all over the place to not do it. I wouldn't recommend it, but we've seen people do it. It is possible. But I do think many have perished judging by the tombstones. It's pretty scary, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, there's not really much else to do here except to take some pictures, enjoy the view, and say that you've been to the southernmost point of the United States. It's really gorgeous, actually. Uh, but there's a big ascent with pastures right over the sea. It's a gorgeous drive. Yeah. Absolutely gorgeous drive. If you, you know, are coming down to the Punalu'u uh, Black Sand Beach and the Bake Shop, you might as well come a little bit further and come and see the southernmost point as well. Yeah. I mean, here you can watch the rains around you and here it's been sunny any time we've been here. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. So we took a few shots and it looks nice. And there's a, something like a blowhole, little cave down there. Yeah. Yeah, so now we're off to the green sand beach, which is gonna be off-roading. It's gonna be interesting. See you out there. forest to get the famous Kona coffee which if you know about is one of the most delicious in the world and while doing so we took the top off the Jeep and it was amazing <laughs> we got our Fuji's so let's go get some coffee mm. smells really good yeah it's light like roast three kinds of roast yeah light which I do like medium and dark which I'm not so much into mm. yes yeah, good, it's good. Really good. We're at Mountain Thunder Coffee where they do free tours every 30 minutes. And they look really friendly and they give you free coffee samples. So I can't go wrong with this place so far. And there's a shop in here with lots of delicious coffee. We just sampled it and it's really, really good. I love the art as well. Have you guys been up here before? No. No. We tried on Saturday. You but tried? It, on Saturday. Is it too late or what? No, it was closed on Saturday. Oh yeah, Iron Man. Yep. Ah, that's why. <laughs> we're only it was, closed yes. three days a year and you found us <laughs> on those days. So we're here at Mountain Thunder Coffee at 3200 feet above sea level, which is why it feels so nice outside. <laughs> it's hot down in Kona and usually muggy this time of year and it's always a relief coming up here. So Kona Coffee is famous because it tastes really good and that's largely in part due to the, the growing conditions up here and in the Kona region. They are perfect for coffee. About as good as you can get anywhere. 
So there's a Kona coffee belt. It's an actual geographic region that you have to grow the coffee within to call yourself Kona coffee. So coffee here in the Big Island in the Kona region starts at about 800 or 900 feet above sea level. That's where it starts growing. And then it comes all the way up to where we are here. We're the highest at 3,200 feet. So between that elevation range is where coffee is most happy. That's about two and a half miles up the mountain. And then that belt goes south past Captain Cook, about 25 or 30 miles that way. The reason they define that region is because the soil conditions and the weather create a certain taste to the cup of coffee. So to be grown in there, yes, you can call yourself Kona coffee and we are within that belt. It's kind of like champagne grapes or champagne wine. You can't call yourself champagne unless you're actually grown in that region. Yeah, so Kona coffee as an industry can get a little bit defensive and edgy sometimes because to be the real thing is very expensive and there's not a lot of it. There's only about 6,000 acres or so planted of true Kona coffee and there's six to seven hundred small farms that grow it. It's mostly mom and pop farms still less than five or seven acres in size. So yeah, to back up, it's the growing conditions here that cause the coffee to taste so good and it's also how we process it, which is what we're going to talk about here in the next part of the tour. This is a coffee tree here. If you've never seen one you can come up and take a look at it it's not going to bite you all the coffee grown here on the farm and in the island in the Kona region is pretty much all Arabica coffee there's another commercial variety called Robusta it doesn't taste as good though it produces more so everything here is Arabica this is a Keturah Arabica tree and the tall skinny one up there and some of these ones grown back here are called Kona Tipica. That was the first variety first brought here in the late 1820s, and it comes from Guatemala. So coffee um, forms fruit, just like a cherry tree, but it's not sweet fruit to eat. And when the coffee is ripe, it turns bright red, which we'll see on the next part of the tour. So we call the ripe ones coffee cherries. Flushes of heavy rainfall will produce the flowers that you can see here. Coffee is a member of the jasmine family, which is why the flowers look very similar. Um, coffee is a difficult crop to pick and manage because it fruits continuously for a large part of the year. Our harvest season runs for at least seven months out of the year. It starts in July and it can go all the way through January. So it doesn't ripen all at once like a product like apples or corn. It kind of fruits continuously as here. And you can see we're getting new flowers, yeah. right? And then on this one here, you've got the tiny coffee beans forming, then you've got ones that are close, and you're gonna have red ones, and this is all happening at the same time. So in order to deal with that, we hand pick all of the ripe coffee, which is very labor intensive and very expensive. Our pickers make 60 to 70 cents per pound, and they can pick three, four, or 500 pounds in a day. So they do pretty well, but it's hard work. The reason we only want the red ones is because that's what tastes the best. If we mix the green coffee in with the red ones, it tastes sour and bitter and it's just not pleasant. So we're in harvest season right now. Once all the cherry comes off the tree, we need to process it quickly because it actually starts to spoil and ferment in less than 48 hours. Hmm. Is coffee considered a tree? Technically it's a tree. Most people think it looks like a shrub, mm -hmm. which I would agree, but yeah, it is a tree. Does any place in the world do it mechanical harvesting? Yeah, oh yeah, a lot of mechanical harvesting. The Kauai Coffee Company does mechanical harvesting. Um, if you have the land for it where it's smooth and it's not rocky and, and that, you can mechanically harvest. We just think it doesn't taste quite as good because there's a lot of mixing in. They can process it out, but then there's a lot of waste. So hand picking is going to produce the best tasting cup of coffee. Do all the Kona coffee companies up here hand pick? Or yeah, I don't know of any anybody? farms here that are mechanically picking, yeah. mostly because of the terrain yeah, so and sorry. of the taste. Okay. Our farm here grows seven acres of 100% organic coffee. We also buy cherry, or this, this is the ripe coffee here, from local Kona coffee farmers, and we process it. So we're a grower and a processor. It's very similar to the, the wine industry. A lot of farmers will just grow grapes and then either sell their juice or their fruit to a winery to then process and bottle. Same thing here. So we're buying a large volume of cherries from local farmers. We take down their plot number to make sure that their farm is within the Kona coffee belt, and then we process it to the highest standards. We separate the pea berry out in the dry mill, which I'll show you after this. Have you guys heard of pea berry coffee before? Most people just know that it's really expensive and there's a reason. Um, in pea berry beans, I can show you. Pea berry is smaller and rounder. A good example of a pea berry there. 
So there's just one round bean and one sliver on the other side. Basically what happened is it's a genetic anomaly when the, when the coffee cherry forms. And this bean is believed to take all the nutrients from the one next to it. So it's sort of like a supercharged coffee bean. So this is our dry milk. Coffee is kind of like a peanut where you have to shell it before you can roast it. Let's see if I can get it out of there. So you've got the outer shell layer. You've also got this fine papery stuff. This is called silver skin. It's like a chaff. We want to remove both of those layers. Otherwise, it just burns in the roaster and it doesn't taste good. This is a Diedrich. This is a, these guys make pretty much the best roasting equipment in the industry. They're actually in Idaho. Here we can do 100 pounds of green coffee at a time. This is just basically a giant rotating oven. It's like a cement mixer that roasts coffee. So this big drum inside is on a big bearing through the center and it just turns. We preheat it to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. The coffee gets loaded in from that hopper up top. That bag is not, that's just a prop. It muffles the sound from the loader. Uh, we actually dump the green coffee into the floor back there and an elevator pulls it out into the, into the hopper. We don't want to work that hard. So 100 pounds goes in, preheated to 400 degrees. It's turning and it's roasting. The longer it roasts, the darker it gets. It's not super complicated. The coffee behaves like popcorn inside the roaster. Um, it will actually pop and crack and expand. So that's why roasted coffee is about 20 to 25% larger than a green coffee bean. It's expanded. All right, so we are nicely caffeinated after sampling all the coffee here at Mountain Thunder Coffee. Very nice place, very friendly people, very good coffee, and it's a gorgeous area here in the cloud forest. It's never too cold, never too hot. It's just right. perfect. And this is supposedly the, as far as they know anyway, the highest elevation coffee that's grown here in Hawaii. They're at 33,200 feet, and yeah. it's a really, really nice climate. Yeah. Very different from further down. Uh, closer to the beach. Exactly. So if you're in Kona, the good thing is you can go up and down and get a different climate within the 10-20 minutes that it takes. Very easy. <laughs> then you can cool off or heat up. Up to you. And get amazing coffee. downtown Kailua in Kona and seems to be the first church built on this island the Hakuna Matata church <laughs> <laughs> the Mokuai Kaua yeah that's what I said church this <laughs> <laughs> is tough because it's one long word if they break it up it's a little easier but I'm not sure how to break that one up Mokuai Kaua Kauawa <laughs> Uh, anyway, established in 1820. So yeah, it's a pretty old church. Oh, so it's after Iron Man, so this is like, you know, there's still some Iron Man people that are around, a lot of people still wearing a lot of the shirts and hats, but it's really calmed down and it's really different than what it looks like during an event. And since we love this part of the Big Island, we thought we would take a little tour of this strip. Yeah, we're spending a whole week in Kona, so now we do downtown Kailua. Baby sister. Are, yes. If you're ever visiting Hawaii, I think most islands, I know definitely Honolulu, 
but this is like your all-around convenience store. You can find most things that you're looking for in addition to, you know, basics like t-shirts, but they are a locally owned business, I believe. And um, yeah, they're all over in the touristy spots. It's about the only store in Waikiki and um, I bought huge bags of macadamia and that's first time I stayed there. That's how I know about them. But I think I also bought a Grey Goose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You can get alcohol, you can get water, you can get, yeah, if you forget your swimsuit, your swimsuit, all kinds of stuff. And yeah. there is a running joke among people that live here that it's called the already been chewed store. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a cool gecko. Yeah, I do wonder what makes it. I don't wonder enough to find out. Part of what I'm seeing here in Hawaii is a whole lot of really cool art and designs. Um, I would buy a lot of these designs. However, in the tropics you don't want to wear cotton. Like we're only wearing the squid dry fabrics nowadays. And if they start putting designs on them, I'll buy them gladly, until then I cannot. Yeah, if you wonder, most of our uh, hot weather destinations, I wear the same two or three shirts <laughs> because of this fabric, this Kapaline cool fabric that Patagonia makes. is just amazing. If you put it on, you definitely feel cooler. Yeah, it's amazing. It's just, and it's quick dry. Yeah. So I sweat a lot, but with this fabric, it like dries instantly. I never feel weighted down like with cotton. And I don't sweat much, so I stay dry entirely all day long with these fabrics. So it's better, it's way better. So I hope soon all these designs start transferring over to the good fabrics. Some beachfront bars here. It's quite nice. Some amazing trees here too. One of the most classic things to do at the beach resorts is the the ocean side or whatever, the, the water side bars, and they do have those here. Though they're not straight up on the water, there's a road in between, which isn't the best thing. Yeah, instead, closer to the water are actual beaches where you can swim, so that's a little more appropriate. <laughs> yeah, that is true. It's pretty expensive. Yeah, the food, I guess, isn't so bad. I mean, you can get little deals like that. You know, it's not you know exorbitantly expensive, but what's going to kill you is the rental car, because you must have a car. Yeah. And uh, also lodging. Because lodging, they give you the base price, and then they add a lot of taxes. Yeah, they're hidden fees of all sorts yeah. here, pissing you off. But, um, and I got the most expensive car Enterprise had, <laughs> just because, because I really wanted to try well, it. And you know, a lot of other people do too. That's right? true. This is the official Kona vehicle right here, everywhere. So, this one is a little older, but we got a 2019 Wrangler. And I have to say, it's one of the best cars I've ever driven. I'm having more fun with it than with the Audis we've been driving. Mm -hmm. And design-wise, it's super well designed. All the choices are correct. Mm -hmm. I love it. Another thing related to cars that's also a little expensive though is the gas. I think it's about $4 a gallon. Uh, there is a Costco, but it is, you know, it's only on the Kona side, so you're going to have to go there specifically if you want a little bit of a discount, but other than that, yeah. yeah, it's expensive here. Yeah, if you get out of Kona, you go by resorts more so that they're isolated, the gas gets really expensive, so get it in town. Yeah, right here in downtown, there's sand, so you can just there's go in. To the beach. <laughs> there's also another one right there. Right there. Yeah, there's many beaches. Tiny little beaches. This yeah. is also, I think, where the Ironman swim competition takes off. Uh, I think they swim through this bay here. Look at the big cloud coming over there. And this is often the case here in Kona, where the hills are rainy, but the beach is sunny. Mm -hmm. And it's really what you want. Yeah. If you want to cool off, you can go up yeah. the hill. If you want to come and swim, you can come down here. And just around the corner, you know, there's the marina there, but there's also another beach, which is pretty cool. Sand and smooth, easy entry, right in downtown Kailua. It's pretty cool, huh? I think this is obviously because there's a hotel right here. Ah, uh, well. They build it up a little bit, but it's nice. Yeah, this is a much bigger sandy area. And once again, it's a beach in Hawaii, which means anyone can go. It's Kapu. Yes. Yes, if you ever are in Hawaii and you see Kapu, it means do not enter, don't go there. It's not the same as a Komomai, which means welcome. Oh, that's it's what the it is. polar opposite of it, like don't go there. Yeah, oftentimes you see stuff and it's like, a Hawaiian word and they expect you to know the meaning, but... Some yeah. places do it better than others. I guess bathrooms are a good example. So you have like kane, which means man, and then uh, wahine, which means woman. And they try to depict it 
right? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes kind of yeah. questionable. If you're not one or the other, I don't know if there's a mahu. <laughs> I don't know if there's quite a, a universally accepted term. So I can't see, but there's like dozens, maybe even a hundred yellow fish, very bright. I wonder if it's like a bit of an infestation because even by our place, we, I saw a lot oh, really? of them in the water. Yeah. I, I saw them way down the coast by, yeah. by the place of, of refuge. We yeah. need a polarizer. Yeah, we, we really definitely need a polarizer. We tried to buy one, but we couldn't find we it. We went so to Walmart far. out of just pure desperation. I knew Walmart wouldn't have pretty it. Pretty sad photography you know. section there. You never know. So we're still here observing these fish, these yellow fish. And earlier I was like, oh, I thought that they were golden leaves at first that had fallen off the trees. But then I thought about it later. I was like, wait a minute, that actually doesn't happen here. You don't get seasonality because of the weather. Uh, the leaves don't actually change. It's like one season all year round, which I think was unusual for probably you the first time you came, or at least your father pointed it out. Well. like trees are weird here compared to everywhere else in the world well sure in the tropics trees can have fruits and blossoms and all stages in the same time and they're not necessarily producing one fruit a year is like many many a year yeah so it's a totally different cycle um, it's more reliable through the day to have the cycle with the clouds over there than it is to have any season you can count on yeah yeah, and I guess if you grow up here, that's just how it is. And you have to move away and live somewhere else to realize that it's different. Um, and actually now in our new house that we just moved into, we have two fruit trees. Or we have a fig, we used to have a fig tree no longer, but we have uh, the pear tree and the persimmon tree. We had a fig tree, so I was able to watch that whole process. But watching the whole process of like trees like being bare and growing and then getting all the leaves and then producing fruit and the fruit falling, I've actually never seen that before. I've never watched the full cycle on like one steady tree and it's mesmerizing. It's really interesting. I wonder, girl, what can I see? Yeah, I'm sure for you it's like, oh, whatever, everybody knows that. It's like, I know that, but I've just not ever watched one or two trees go through that whole cycle. <laughs> and it's really exciting, it's really cool. Yeah. Oh, here you can watch geckos instead. Yeah. There they are. My brother and I used to chase geckos and we'd find the little eggs and I remember we used to like pick up the eggs and then we found ways to like incubate them and hatch the eggs. So, so that's the kind of thing when you, you do when you grow up here. It's still there. It's sideways. Yeah. It's pretty funny. It thinks it's being clever. Ooh, it's so happening. that's the nice thing about rain as well. Is that that's how you get rainbows. This is why Hawaii is the rainbow island. You have them every single day. Yeah. It's actually quite spectacular. And right now, very close here, is a big rain. I hope it doesn't... Uh, it is kind of coming. It looks rain. like coming as now the clouds are over us. But straight ahead... Do you have your zoom? I do, yes. Yeah, I should put it on. drove to the desert to escape the rain and ended up at See this place summit. called cool. Waikoloa village yes. and here's Waikoloa beach and we're right in the slopes of two at least mountains but there's actually four nearby and in the middle of them is a desert which is very interesting and right here we can see the summit of Mauna Kea with all the telescopes showing above the clouds which is pretty awesome very cool the summit we wanted to go to couldn't quite make it we got blocked and here we have a lot of feral cats for some reason they're kind of nice looking feral cat relocation spot oh is that what it is here, here. interesting they get spayed and then they come up huh it is a whole colony of them wow there are a lot of them Lots and lots of cats. <laughs> Ooh, the bathroom is solid lava rock. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. Well, gotta do something with it. Amazing. Not too shabby. It's pretty legit. Yeah, with it's a nice. lagoon. Yeah. And of course canoes and everything. And a beach bar. So we finally made it to the beach and it's a very gentle night. It's warm and a little bit of breeze. I'm it's inspired to take photos for some reason. Well, you have the means to and a good place for it. Yes. 
Guess I'll be doing videos as I have been. down this wilder part of the beach it's a sunset walk here it's a lot more sandy but you may get splashed I'm using my Kings like snowshoes so I don't sink <laughs> smells like turtles hey. <laughs> like this oh. yeah it's pretty cute this is what we've been doing for almost two weeks now. Hanging out on beaches and taking videos of turtles, yeah. <laughs> Some Fujifilm red badge action here. little glimpse here. So we spent this past week on Big Island and it's our favorite island because it is the largest and youngest island and it's not as populated as Oahu and so it feels a little bit more relaxing here. And yes, more, more, to do. more relaxing and more adventurous as well. There are many really epic attractions and it takes a while to get to them mm -hmm. so you're actually doing travel adventuring which is our favorite style. And you also have the nicest beaches ever. Yeah, and they're more private because they're not as obviously yellow sand beach or white sand beach as like some of the other islands here. A little bit more rugged, but that gives it more character. And it's more interesting from a photography perspective as well. Yeah, there are many, many wild ones. There's some more cultivated ones. So you get to choose whatever you want. Mm -hmm. The particular area we stayed in, this resort I think is called Kanaloa and it's positioned right between the Kona Country Club and another golf course so it's really quite of a loaded area and it's right off of Kailua right now in the end of the main strip Ali Drive and it's also right under the coffee belt so if you just go 10 minutes up you're already in the coffee farms mm -hmm. it's a really really good area here uh, I think the general town is called Keaho and we're kind of right off it on the beach. Mm -hmm. We even have a little shopping center nearby, so it's been a really convenient location. Yeah, very good location. The resort itself is fantastic. I don't know if I've been to a better resort than this. And I think Kona is the best place to stay. And Kona, by the way, is a county, not a town. It has many towns, but it's a whole county. It's very large. So mm -hmm. you need a car and it takes a while to explore it. Yeah, so it's been a really great trip. We went all out with the Jeep this time, which is a nice upgrade from our last trip. So it allowed us to drive to the bottom of Waipio Valley. And we did have other plans to use that Jeep, but they were a little foiled, like Mauna Kea wasn't possible, the Green Sand Beach wasn't possible, but luckily we were able to at least do the Green Sand Beach on the previous trip. Yeah, that's true for us. It doesn't quite matter because we know we're coming here many times. Mm -hmm. It's one of our very favorite places. We have direct flights from Seattle, and the prices are actually a little bit lower than Seattle when it comes to spending money. Mm -hmm. So for us, it doesn't break the bank. But for a lot of people, it's very hard to get here. Yeah. So we love it. We'll be back. Jeep is the vehicle for here. Mm -hmm. And if you're here, if you're planning to be here, you can probably see almost everything big in one week. But if you wanted to rest in between as well, you need two weeks here. It's yeah. a large place. So if you want to do both resting in great environment and see all the attractions, book mm -hmm. two weeks on the Big Island alone. And Kona is a great base. Uh, I like it this way the most. Mm -hmm. Same. We'll see you in future content.